Let's see, uh, let's see if we can go through this rather unusual story uh, about what happened to this children. Over the years, you know, we've carried out inspections, many, many inspections of pressure vessels. And sometimes uh, the vessels, uh, we have problems even when uh, they're new, when they're being manufactured. And in this particular case, we had a, uh, a really quite a large uh, vacuum deodorizing vessel. And the, uh, the vessel itself was being made in Europe for destined for an overseas client. And the vacuum uh, is, is very high vacuum and quite high temperatures, about 230 degrees. And the purpose of this vessel is to deodorize uh, edible oils, seed oils, vegetable oils. And we have to do this uh, in order to remove certain organic, odiferous organic compounds. Okay, so, so this is a vessel, it, it's, it's not new technology. These deodorizing vessels are very common in the uh, um, edible oils industry. And there are literally thousands of them around the world. But in this particular case, we were uh, carrying out instructions for uh, one client who was uh, requested the construction of four, three, four of these vessels. Uh, at a number of plants in South America and uh, one for the partner Alliance Company in the Caribbean. So uh, what happened was we, we made initial communications with the company, the fabricator in, in Europe and explained that we were going to, we'd been asked by our client to come and have a look at the vessel during construction, routine inspections and essentially, it was a not even really a troubleshooting exercise. It was just uh, our client had this uh, sort of um, this uh, reliability engineering approach where it, it, it thought it, it believed that it was worthwhile spending the extra time and money to, 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 to take an overview of the vessel construction. So we visited the fabricator and uh, they were at the final stage of construction. And just before that, it was, we noticed it was quite difficult um, to, to get, to receive feedback about what exact stage of construction they were at. A number of things happened that made us, gave us some concern really. So we arrived on site and were able to examine the vessel. And we found that um, actually it was due for shipment and they were at the point where they were in fitting the, a wooden crate for its transport, transport across the Atlantic. So we had a look at the vessel and we know that the fabricator was under a lot of pressure and uh, they hadn't finished some of the welding or some of the welding on the nozzles. So we, we sort of uh, made notes of all the, the def all the defects that we found and the, um, the it's essentially they made a request that with our client that they re, re, um, repair the welds and the defects when it arrived on site. And the reason for this is that there just simply wasn't enough time to do this uh, on site at the factory in Europe. So the vessel here on the slide, you can see this is the bottom of the vessel. It's quite large. It's 316L stainless steel. And the... Um, it has seven internal, six or seven internal chambers. And each of these chambers performs a different function. So here's a sort of a schematic view of a, of a typical sort of deodorizing vessel. And in fact, the, the oil arrives in the top where, where it goes through initial heating. It's a degassing stage. And then the next stage, it drops down. Uh, it's a batch process, a semi-continuous process. It drops down and it goes through a preheating stage. And then it drops down again into the third chamber, into the deodorizing stage. And this is where the oil is heated to 230, 225 degrees C. And the um, volatile organic compounds, the fatty acids, uh, boil off effectively and are pulled off the top under vacuum. And they pass through a scrubber system and are um, if effectively remove that nasty taste from the oil. So 
when this is complete, the the oil itself then drops through into uh, a holding stage where it's maintained at a certain temperature for a period of time, and then it goes through the cooling stage. So, so it's a process that, um, when you think about it, it, it's quite dangerous because it's high vacuum. It's heated with a high pressure, high temperature heating coil. It's at 90, normal operation pressure is about 60, 65 bar. But the, bo the boiler, that's used for heating the oil and the steam with the steam coils is uh, for 90 bar, um, 90 bar pressure. So with this vessel, uh, with this, uh, with these conditions, what we need is a vessel that's fabricated to a code, ASME code, ASME pressure vessel code, or some other European code. Um, and obviously the condition of the welds and the structure is of utmost importance. Um, not really in terms of the vessel being dangerous in a sense, but if it leaks, there's a major loss of uh, uh, capacity, uh, loss of vacuum, and therefore a, a problem with trying to process the oil. So in this case, the, um, when, we, when we found the defects inside the vessel, we found that um, there were welds which were incomplete and some of them contained fusion defects and incomplete penetration. And the, on the image that you can see now, the, um, the nozzle inside actually has no weld on it at all internally. Okay, so the reality is that the vessel's been made at, at quite, uh, quite quickly, the fabricator's under pressure, and the only thing really then was to say, right, okay, well, let's, uh, let's do these repairs or let's finish the welding when it arrives on site. So, so the vessel was sent away and uh, shipped over to the Caribbean. And uh, a couple of months later, when it arrived, we were asked or I was asked to go and have a look at this vessel uh, when it arrived on site, just to, to, to see, in fact, whether any of the repairs had been made because the fabricator said just before it left that some of them would be. And we documented the number and location of repairs. So our client basically asked us to, to, to do an inspection as soon as it arrived on site. This would allow us to determine what kind of resources would be required locally and by the fabricators, uh, welders, the two welders. Okay, so when the vessel arrived to site, it was, uh, as you can see in the image, it was lifted in one piece. And when we opened the vessel up, we could see um, when we opened the manway uh, doors, I, I actually put my head inside the vessel and suddenly I couldn't breathe. The vessel was actually in a horizontal position and, and I just couldn't breathe. And I, and I took my head out and realized that there was no very little oxygen inside the vessel. So for me, I mean, this was a number of years ago and, and this was strange. And um, really, it didn't, it didn't sort of, we didn't appreciate, really didn't appreciate just what in fact was happening. So... We, let, we took the manway covers off and we allowed air to circulate inside each of the six or seven chambers. And then what happened was we were able to take a proper look inside each chamber and we found a, a quantity of, of really quite bright green liquor. And as soon as I, I saw the liquor and it was, it was slightly milky in, in, in sort of... Um, milky green in color, color. So my immediate thought was, this looks like uh, some kind of washed down liquor, but the color of it suggested that it contained nickel salts. Again, you know, at this, at this point, we were sort of thinking, well, this is kind of, this is kind of strange, this. What, what would it be? Did the, were they washing the vessel? So within a day or two, we'd had discussions with the fabricator and we found uh, that what that liquor was, was actually 
wash down residue um, from the pickle uh, acid cleaning pickling process. So uh, what had happened on, on that photograph that you can see in front of you with the, the nozzle connections, the tube connections to the header, there's no uh, heat tint. And the heat tint, the thermal oxide had been uh, removed with this pickling paste. Basically, it's, it's not an unusual procedure and is a good way of removing these thermal oxides because in this kind of equipment, the presence can be the uh, can cause problems in terms of the accumulation of uh, polymerized oil based uh, substances. Okay, so on the clean metal surface, it's easy to clean them off. And we, we realized then that um, the fabricators explained that they had um, chemically cleaned the inside of the vessel with this pickling paste. So at the same time, when we looked inside, because we'd seen the green liquor, we thought, uh, okay, the, actually there were no signs of corrosion anywhere. So even though this vessel had been in transit for a couple of months, there was no, no obvious signs of corrosion activity. There was no signs of rust deposits or other types of corrosion deposits. So from that position, looking into the vessel, all seemed to be okay. And obviously with the liquor, the idea was that uh, when the vessel was taken from the dockyard to the site, that the the um, liquor would be drained out and the vessel would be washed down properly. So the next stage was when the vessel arrived to site, when it was drained down from the bottom, we found there was quite a large quantity of uh, cream colored deposits inside each of the chambers. And these two images clearly show that um, that, you know, it's a significant quantity. Now, at, at this time, uh, I didn't realize, or we didn't realize that this, what we were looking at was the residue from the pickling paste. In fact, it contained uh, barium salt. So it was probably barium sulfate, which is a, a chemical compound that's used to thicken uh, this type of acid paste so that you can apply it to a surface and it won't drain off the surface. Also, these pickling pastes are really quite aggressive and, and they literally, uh, the problem with them is the contact time needs to be kept to a minimum because it literally is and that's its function, is to remove a surface layer, a few microns thick of the entire surface layer of the, uh, the metal surface and the welds to clean them. So on this image, when you look at the image, the right-hand image at the bottom right hand in the corner, you can see there's evidence of rusting here on, on, this, on the plate. So this is the view of the vessel in the vertical position. So clearly what happened since the vessel was taken from the dockyard and oxygen was allowed to enter the vessel and it, when it was lifted into the vertical position, um, a corrosion process has started. So we, we didn't really, at this stage, again, we didn't really, we thought, okay, this can be cleaned out. It's not that big a deal. Um, but these deposits were actually quite difficult to remove. They weren't really water soluble. So whatever mixture of chemical compounds that were there, they were not particularly um, soluble when, when attempts were made to wash out, to flush out the vessel. So th this did happen and we removed all of these cream colored deposits. Everything was eventually washed out using jet washing, high pressure. So as time went by and the constructed and the ancillary equipment was being positioned around the main vessel, um, we, we were asked to, to have a look at the vessel again when the fabricators, welders, had visited the site to make the repairs. And they came to site and they made the repairs and they did a good job. And effectively, their role was to complete the repairs 
and to um, ensure that whatever work they did, any remedial work, was in accordance with the um, ASME pressure vessel code. So this happened. As time went by and we were involved with the construction of the, the 90 bar, 95 bar boiler, which was to be connected to this uh, deodorizer, on site, we noticed that uh, there were other issues generally with respect to the, the condition of this vessel. And um, when we looked at the external surface, we could see there was a lot of, as you can see on the image, a lot of rust deposits. And what we can see here, I mean, this is a, a brand new stainless steel 316TI or 316TI6L vessel with all of these um, corrosion deposits on the outside. So when I saw this, I thought, ah, okay, I understand why this is here because these deposits are caused by the overspray when the, the gray pipe was being welded because the gray section of piping, the two circular rings are the steam inlet rings. And those pipes are made of carbon steel. So when they cut the pipe, to fit and ground it and then welded it, that was the overspray, which, which in the sort of marine environment naturally started to rust because it, it can be quite humid in that part of the world, you know. So, okay, time progressed on and we thought, ah, okay, so th this needs to be rectified as well. And um, sure enough, it, it was. So this was in May, 1994. Well, um, things were progressing. The plant was being built. We were getting ready. The, the client was in the position to start commissioning in the summer of 94. And then uh, just a little bit later on, I received a phone call and it was, uh, I actually was investigating the failure of a, of a 95 bar boiler over at an, in another country in the Caribbean. And ironically, that failure of that boy, it was a, uh, an explosion. But the, the, the vessel that it was connected to was very similar in construction to, to this deodorizing vessel. So, you know, we, we, time was moving on. And when I was there investigating that e explosion of the boiler, we received contact from the client in, uh, in the Caribbean and they'd realized they found that the heating coils inside the vessels had failed. So those veils, those uh, heating coils, which are called mammoth pumps, they work like on a thermosiphon um, recycle um, cyclic process where the oil circulates through from the bottom of the coil up to the top and outside. So it's a sort of thermal uh, cycle effect. And there are six coils in three or four of the uh, trays at the stages in the vessel. So when they did the pressure test, they found that the, um, the coils had failed. And, you know, at this point, we, we sort of realized that um, Oh, there was big. There were bigger problems here with this vessel than we initially thought. So um, the, the 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 client was not sure then and notified the fabricator and the engineering company that this failure had occurred and certain discussions took place. I arrived on site and uh, as soon as I arrived. I had the opportunity to inspect the coils because we knew that the, um, the pressure loss was occurring inside the vessel rather on than the, the pipework between the vessel and the high pressure boiler. So when I um, was able to go inside the vessel for the inspection, I could see immediately that there was localized corrosion on the welds. And on the image that you see here, this is what's called a, a mammoth pump. It really is a highly efficient um, heating uh, coil. And it's a, a, double, a double coil system. 
So um, there are six of these in this particular tray, and almost all of the weld appeared to be affected by this localized corrosion. In fact, it was pitting corrosion. So at this point then, we uh, decided that we needed to remove sections of these coils in order to, to we had no choice because of the limited uh, restricted um, space inside each chamber. There was some, the question was uh, for us then is how do we actually repair these coils? Is, is there a repair procedure? And you know, these coils, when you think that they are used for steam heating up to uh, 60, 60 bar, 65 bar pressure, and very high temperature, it's, the, the truth is it's very specialized fabrication work. And, and at the time, there probably wasn't a contractor locally that was capable of being able to perform these types of repairs in accordance with the particular design code to which these coils were made. So we started to remove sections of coils and uh, found more pitting. And as you can see in this photograph, these, one of the butt welds was corroded in a number of plates. And, and, and in fact, when you look at the image, you can see the corrosion deposit was very localized. So what we had was very localized pitting specifically in the welds. Now, the rest of the coil actually was okay, but the problem was almost all of the welds had pitted. Now, when, when this happens, uh, really when we see this kind of corrosion in, on a stainless steel vessels, at any type of, um, Austenitic, any type of stainless steel alloy, it on welds like this, it tends to indicate that the weld has suffered preferential corrosion, preferential attack. And the usual, uh, the suspect is uh, the culprit is uh, chlorides. So we then had a situation uh, with this vessel and um, really our, our concern then was with this was we had so many issues. How do we repair these coils? Who can repair them? Who's going to pay for it? And um, how do we physically take new coils through the manways entrances because they were too small? So as things were unfolding, we then reached a point where we had to sort of think about, well, what about the condition of the rest of the plant? Now, during this process um, of the investigation, we found that um, when the vessel was being pressure tested, um, the, the water, it was well water, was, was uh, pumped into the system and effectively the coils were pressure tested and parts of the system were pressure tested. But the, the thing was, the um, cooling water wasn't able to be drained from the vessel so it was left inside the vessel for some time. So we began to think then at this point well what else is happening else, elsewhere around the plant, the plant say for example with the uh, heat exchangers, the plate heat exchangers, shell and tube heat exchangers, uh, process pipe work, valves, and various other types of equipment. So we were essentially, have the, uh, we were requested then to carry out a full survey of the vessel throughout and also all of the other equipment that the vessel was connected to and that was subjected to the uh, hydrostatic test. So we went through you know, this process and uh, effect, essentially, certain tests were carried out on, the, on the, the residues which were found inside the vessel. And we realized, in fact, that what we had was these um, chemical residues that were traced back to the original uh, passive uh, pickling procedure that was used to clean the vessel. So there were also chlorides found in the residues inside the, the trays. 
So it's really quite a complicated picture. So we had the chemicals or traces of the chemicals from the original fabrication, plus chlorides, um, which, which didn't necessarily um, arrive from the, the water that was used to clean the vessel when it was at the fabricator's shop in, uh, in Europe. So complicated picture and it was unfolding. We were trying to sort of work our way through this to work out just really what, what, what was the, 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 the real sequence of events? What was really happening? And what were the causal factors for this, uh, for the failures, for the failures of the heating coils? So um, further inspections took place uh, inside the vessel. Obviously we found evidence of localized corrosion on the valve bodies and on the longitudinal seams. Now, these are the shell structural welds. The presence of, these, uh, of this corrosion activity didn't necessarily mean that there was a, a problem with the structural integrity of the vessel, but obviously it did mean that a significant amount of remedial work was going to be required to um, restore the vessel to an acceptable condition. So just looking at those two images, what we have is uh, localized corrosion on the vertical longitudinal seam. And you can see there are three, four, five corrosion sites uh, with um, oxides, iron oxides, rust in, in one ionic form or another. But on the left-hand image, you can see the valve body. So the body itself uh, is pitted. Now, the reason this has happened is that that valve body is in fact a cast microstructure, not a rod, so forged. So it's in a similar metallurgical condition to the weld metal. And, and often you will find that uh, the welds in a system, whether it's pipework, the vessels, tanks, that'll be the first the weak link, the first point where corrosion will start and there are clear metallurgical reasons for that, which we may discuss another day. But when we saw this, this level of activity, um, we were able to, to begin to draw some conclusions, you know, and to say, right, okay, irrespective of who's responsible for this, we, we need to know what's happened to see whether we can reinstate this vessel and, and do something with it. So, um, we did this and uh, we were, our brief then at this stage was um, really not this before we actually incurred any expenditure on attempting to repair the vessel or have new coils made in Europe because that was the only place we could source them. Um, the decision was then made was really to, to carry out to perform a full structural survey of the vessel uh, and in particular of the condition of the welds to determine, to make sure, in fact, that it was, it would be safe to operate when it was going to be after it had been repaired. Okay, so we went through this process and we found some problems. Uh, after many hours of examining the vessel, we could see it's always the way, the more you look, the more you can see, the more things you find. When we looked at the vessel on the outside and the vessel wasn't lagged, we could see in fact that there were um, some repairs, repairs to the shell, which, which really began to cause concern because we were thinking this is, our view was this is a, a new vessel. Why are such uh, long repairs being, why had they been made to the shell of the vessel? So um, really then we decided in the discussions with the fabricator, it transpired that the, the vessel, uh, they'd had problems with these stiffening rings or anti-seismic rings. So um, these rings, which you can see in this image here, the, these provide stiffening to the shell in the event of earthquakes that part of the world is prone to earthquakes. So these rings are fitted at different positions along the shell to stiffen the shell, the, the cylinder section. Now on the photograph, you can see in fact that the ring has been moved from an original position to a new position. 
And it seems that a mistake was made in the positioning of these rings in the first plate when it, when it was being fabricated. So uh, at this point, we sort of uh, were becoming concerned and, and our brief then really, the new brief was to determine at that point whether the, ves the vessel was fit for service. And in fact, any remedial work and repairs ha that had been carried out, as you can see on this image in the two arrowed sections, whether those repairs had been carried out properly. So uh, we commissioned a company locally to carry out some radiographic um, tests on these areas. And we found linear um, defects inside the shell. And it transpired that they, um, they were weld defects. And, and what had happened at this point then, they, the, weld, the weld repairs hadn't been carried out properly and the shell contained a number of linear defects, the size of which exceeded the acceptance criteria for the code, for the design code for the vessel. So at this point, you know, we were, we were thinking, right, okay, can these be repaired? But the decision then was made between the, the fabricator, the engineering design company and the client. And we realized we'd reached a point where there were so many defects um, had come to light the major cost would have been replacing the coils, the heating coils. And, and really, it, it was uh, virtually impossible to manufacture these coils locally in the region because, you know, this kind of equipment is not made in the Caribbean, Caribbean region. And um, really, anything that any new coils had to be made from sourced from Europe or from North America. So eventually, we reached the point where the vessel. Um, was clearly not, uh, in the end, not built to the standard. And the uh, corrosion related problems were just really part of the problem. And it's ironic that we had so many um, problems that seemed to overlap. And they, in the end, the decision was made to um, replace the vessel. So, so this vessel and this image is that vessel you saw at the beginning is being cut into pieces and being shipped over to another country as scrap um, because really there was nothing we could do. And um, at this point, the timing wise, the client, our client was very good about it and said, you know, we do have oil refining capacity anyway, and that this was more of an expansion project and the, um, the engineering company, the fabricator, the, they decided to replace the vessel free of charge. And in the meantime, we had to take the old vessel out and go through the process of uh, really supervising the construction of the new vessel. So, you know, we, we, it, it, was, it took quite a long time and we were confronted with problems that we didn't really clearly understand, but now, on reflection and we look back and you could say, well, really, um, what, what actually happened here? And it was a, a variety of factors. Um, the, um, the, in the beginning with the fabrication shortcomings, the problems with just basic welding and the, uh, the management of fabrication, we believe there were several issues there, uh, management changes within the company. And, this didn't help the situation in terms of the internal quality control at the fabricator's yard. But when the vessel came to site and was being commissioned, people didn't realize how important it was uh, to not put water inside the vessel that contained chlorides. And certainly in a vessel that also in fact contained some chemical residues from the original uh, chemical cleaning of the vessel during manufacture. So um, the, at the end of the story, if, if you like, the, uh, the lessons, the uh, lessons to be learned, you know, there's been a number of situations over the years when we've been involved with vessels that actually um, had to be replaced or 
had had to have major well repairs in order to rectify um, fabrication defects. And um, there's a variety of reasons why these defects arise, but you know, it's important that no matter when you're dealing with engineering companies and they or they are making pressure vessels or pressurized equipment, storage tanks or whatever type of uh, equipment, really it, our view is that it's quite important that you need to oversee their activities to make sure that in fact, as the client, you're getting what you paid for. And the fabricators, we know many fabricators and they do a very good job and they are very good. And uh, nowadays you're less likely to come across this kind of problem because people are just more aware of the potential risks of using um, chloride containing um, hydro test water or the chemical cleaning and passivation procedures that are used or utilized for pressure vessels, especially during the foods and pharmaceutical manufacturing side. Um, really, we've got to be very careful how we control these procedures, very careful. So um, another point and the second point here is um, what we have found is that most failures occur not as a result of main structural structural weld related defects in the main structural welds they they often occur uh, when somebody comes along and attaches a fillet weld a bracket or something to a vessel with a fillet weld so it's it's not a, a pressure containing weld but the presence of that weld um, allows certain types of uh, fatigue defects, uh, fatigue failures to develop over a period of time. And also the, the attachment of this equipment to, to the shell of a vessel can compromise its structural integrity because of the stresses that are generated when we, when we physically attach the, um, the bracketry or pipework to the shell. So it needs to monitor construction. And the final point then is uh, in terms of post-fabrication testing. You know, um, pressure testing, it's still a problem now. And um, hydro testing, stainless steels, it's really simple, stainless steels and aggressive ion species like chlorides and nitrates um, really are a problem. And stainless, the, the standard stainless steels that we use are really not suitable and are, are not very corrosion resistant to this type of ion. So we find two or three times a year problems that relate to the hydro testing of equipment that causes uh, sometimes even rouging. And that's something which we're all familiar with. But, but really it's, it's a problem that needs to be monitored. And um, pressure testing is not a straightforward procedure. And, and if the opportunity, if you if you want to be ultra safe, then don't pressure test vessels, stainless steel vessels, with water up that contains chlorides or chlorides are level. It's maybe less than twenty parts per million, or better still, deionized water. So finally, then uh, I hope it's not too long a journey for you. I'd like to thank you for attending the presentation. And obviously you have my contact details here. And if you just have any, any questions, any queries about things that you see, um, it's really quite simple because we've probably seen it before. And after so many years of, of doing this and inspecting plant and equipment all over the world, it's a lifetime's work. Quite often we see things now and it doesn't require investigation. You can just go and just a few photographs will tell us what the problem is. We'll be able to recognize what kind of failure mechanism it is and, and what the possible causal factors are. So thanks very much for listening, Jim.
There we go. Yeah. Malcolm, yeah. thanks very much. That was a, a great presentation. Um, very interesting. I think uh, there's very few examples we've ever come across where we've had so many things going wrong at the same time on a new vessel. And uh, I, I would say it was a, bit of a disaster for the owners of the, the company and probably for the fabricators as well at the end of the day, because uh, so many things went wrong. I mean, some of the some of the questions that probably are coming up tonight are based around, you know, for us in industry, when we're buying fabrications, either large ones or small ones like this, how careful do we have to be with the checks that are carried out during fabrication? Because it's it, to me, it seems if you wait until the vessel arrives or any of the fabrications arrive on site, it's too late. So could you just give us a little bit of a, a, a view on what we should be all doing during fabrication as, as end users to make sure we have reliable equipment? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. Um, well, at the end of the day, nowadays, um, when equipment like this is being fabricated, vessels for the farmer industry, for example, um, really, we know that those vessels are being, the, the, the fabrication of construction is being monitored by a number of people. And um, that's by um, the, the, the fabricators in-house quality control people, the third party inspection company that is uh, brought in to do the statutory inspections in accordance with the pressure vessel code. And then um, we've got the insurance inspections which take place during construction to ensure that the, the, the fabrication, the welding in particular, is being carried out properly and, and in accordance with the, the welding procedures that, that would be issued by the fabricator in the first place. Mm -hmm. so, so, so what we have though is really there's a gap and what you need to do is when the vessel's being fabricated, it's important really that as the client that you go in and have a look at the make one or two visits and during construction it may maybe at the beginning and one half to two thirds of the way through construction because at the end of construction several people are inspecting the equipment really what we want to do if there are problems arising with the the type problems with the surface finishing or say the standard of welding or, or the welding procedures themselves. These are things that need to be rectified at the beginning of construction. And, and often really, if you've got, if you have the knowledge, you can go in and, and even with fabricators, fabricators that make hundreds of vessels every year uh, to different codes and with different types of alloys, um, they need some help sometimes because they are so overloaded with work and it, it's really difficult um, trying to keep control of the situation. So it's important, I think, as the client, if you're buying this equipment, is to go in and do your own inspection and just, um, just watch the, the activities and, and just what we're really not looking for is if it's a pressure vessel, for example, is we know that the main structural welds of the pressure vessel will be okay they will be um, because the controls and checks that are in place will make sure that they are. The mm. problem arises that we find are with non-critical welds. More than 90% of the failures that we find are non-critical welds. So what will happen is that the fabricators, not all of them, but some of them, they'll, they'll um, deploy people who don't have the same level of welding skills and experience onto attaching these pieces of equipment or brackets or connections to the vessels. And that process can compromise the actual pressure containing integrity of the equipment. So okay. the, those checks are made. So it's important that when you go in, you, you, you walk through the workshop, you see, have a look and see how, what the housekeeping like, it just gives you an idea of how, how the, the fabricator is in control of things. Yeah, okay. You know. So a, a question here from uh, Paddy Sheridan. With the presence of chlorides, would intergranular stress corrosion cracking be an inevitable outcome? Uh, no. 
the uh, problem that we saw with this vessel is that um, because it's very localized corrosion, stainless steel actually it has very good corrosion resistance, but but we need to define what the corrosion resistance is. It's very good in terms of resistance against general corrosion, but not at localized corrosion where aggressive ions like chlorides will attack specific parts of the metal surface. And in particular, the welds, because the welds are, are not a single phase structure. So they are susceptible because the chlorides carry negative charge. Now, uh, stainless steels, if you have chloride concentration in, in the water, if you pressure test the vessel, if it's above about uh, 60, 80 ppm, the risk significant, significantly increases uh, for pitting corrosion, even with a short time exposure. But stress corrosion cracking is, is um, as the name suggests, is a condition that arises that requires a high level of residual stress in the metal. And one thing you'll always find is, it, it, particularly in the food industry, you'll find SCC, well, throughout all of the industries really, SCC doesn't really occur until the temperatures are above 60 degrees C. And we don't really know why this is the case. But the other thing to remember is that stress corrosion cracking caused by chlorides really happens more in thin sheet, thin piece sections of metal than thicker sections. And that's because the thinner sections of metal like dairy pipe or shed 10, shed 20 stainless steel pipe has thin walls but also the process to make the thin wall tube, the pipe, involves uh, introducing a higher level of stress during manufacture. So that when the when the equipment goes in service, it, it's then in a stressed condition where in some cases, the internal stress uh, can be ex almost as high as or exceed the yield stress for the metal. Okay, very good. Yeah. Here's a question from John Coleman, and it, it, I suppose it, it, it goes back to the the example and the, the root causes. Was it just plain carelessness, carelessness on the fabricator's behalf, or was there a fundamental lack of skills within the organisation? A failure to complete the wells is more than a lack of quality control. Yeah, um, we found out some time later, and actually the fabricators, it, it's ironic, the engineering company, who designed this equipment, they, they, they used to make lots of these vessels and they were made by different companies in Europe. And they're all good companies, they're all good fabricators. What we think happened here is, we can't be 100% certain, but it seems that potentially there were management changes within the fabricator, at the fabricator's premises, um, management changes within the quality control department. And, um, there was obviously a weakness on that side of the construction because um, you could argue that there was insufficient quality control. And I think to coupled with that, so, there were, so that was one problem, but at the same time, there were um, delivery schedules. So the fabricator was under pressure to get this vessel made, and it's a huge vessel, to get it made in time. And, you know, it, it's often the case that... Um, well, you know, you can do your best, but you've got a, a book, a, a ship that's booked for a certain date. You have to get this vessel out and whatever design fabrication problems you have, it has to be on that ship for that journey. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I think really it was the two, it was just an unfortunate set of circumstances, really. Yeah, yeah. On a, on a more personal note, Paul Phelan asked the question, it sounds like it was a very difficult situation for you to be caught between the client and the fabricator. How did you manage the stress? It, it was stressful, yeah, good, really good question. Actually, it uh, comes up quite often, <laughs> that situation. It's very difficult because um, really now with hindsight, if this situation arose again, we probably handle it differently and um, actually uh, arrange for a delay in the shipment of the vessel in order to make yeah, sure yeah. that we were going to the vessel when it left was going to be fabricated to the code 
but it, it's a it's a tricky thing because the fabricators of course and it's difficult for them it is really difficult because you know they're under pressure and costs have to be controlled and you know if you want the best job there's there's a price to pay for that you, you've got to mm. pay for it and it's um yeah it's a difficult one but the fabricator I think they realise, well, I know for a fact that they realised that uh, mistakes were made, but there was nothing they could do because this this vessel was on its way over to the Caribbean. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, 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 I think nowadays, though, I mean, what we've got to do, it's a good point that he raised, though, because what, what we want to do is where, where a fabricator is struggling, and there are, in Ireland, there's great fabricators there. That there are, you know, that they know how to make pressure vessels. But there are smaller fabricators who... Who don't quite have the experience so it's important really we want them to do the job properly to, to fabricate at cost to the cost and uh, in accordance with the design code so uh, really we have to work together with the fabricator and say right well these are the issues look these are the solutions let's let's rectify it now it, it doesn't yeah, require yeah. a huge amount of debate it's just got to be dealt with and to move on yeah, and uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here because I know we're just we have about six minutes left, and this is great and it's a very interesting conversation. But I think what a number of people are saying or asking, Oliver Lynch is asking, Chris Collins is asking as well. In in terms of the the lessons learned, how would how was this going to be prevented from happening again? Was there any change in specifications by the company? Was there any change in the FAT requirements so that something like this couldn't be shipped being so defective? There are questions around where there weld logs in the first place, were they signed off? How, how could we, and what do we have today, you know, in 2021 that would tell us this could never happen again? Well, we, well, the truth is, and, you know, in essence, we have better controls now. We really do. And, and I think, you know, with the internet, People are more aware of um, passivation pickling procedures. People are, the information is freely available in, in that domain. And, and also when it comes to fabricating vessels, you know, the, the fabricators have gone through this learning process and, and nowadays they're, they're, you know, really quite efficient at doing this. So actually, I don't think this situation would arise again because you know, this, the discussions that we would have with the client and with the fabricator, we'd have stopped the shipment of the vessel, but we, we, we were allowed to examine the vessel at such a late stage, although we wanted to do it several weeks earlier, and they declined. Mm. So that, that, to me, was uh, the red flag, and I thought, there's something wrong here. But okay. it's different nowadays, but I'll say one thing, though. The thing to watch out for nowadays with vessels, pressure vessels, is the welding, is how we weld it. And uh, those weld procedures, we need to follow them more closely. So just quickly, if you're going to make a nozzle to a dished end weld or a, a, shell, a shell structural weld, that weld must be made in accordance with the weld procedure with X number weld passes, not more to make the weld bigger, or too many, uh, or too, or, or less, a lesser number of welds. That's why the weld procedures allow us to control the the mechanical properties and as as deposited as deposited visual appearance of the weld. So it's still an issue, yeah. but not not quite the same problem. Yeah. And I mean, you know, in, in Ireland, we have a lot of life sciences industry activity at Malcolm, and I know you're involved in quite a lot of inspections in these companies. Do you think that, this is a question from Mark Crosby, I mean, do you think that the life sciences industry pay enough attention to reliability in, in design during project phase to prevent these type of things happening? It's, it's definitely improving, uh, mm. is for sure. Um, the reason is that people are becoming more aware now, e even the fabricators and um, all the fabricators are becoming aware of the, uh, how could you say, the um, metallurgical properties of the materials that they're fabricating with. And, you know, it, it is a learning process. It's improving, but there is still work to do because um, 
generally speaking, it's if if you if 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 I was if my client was going to have a vessel built right for say a pharmaceutical application, if if we didn't say that you know if they didn't suggest or state to the fabricator that there weren't that there was going to be nobody from the client side was going to physically inspect the vessel during construction. It, you, can, <coughs> you can imagine that potentially this could cause a problem because there are other vessels being made or equipment being made by the fabricator that actually are being more uh, rigidly monitored by other clients. So, you know, mm. it, it's important that we we make it clear up front that you know that you you're going to make uh, you know routine random inspections just to oversee the construction and, and make sure that in fact that the the manufacturers are doing what the the design requires and what they're being paid to do i yeah, know yeah. it's a very simplistic approach but you know it's um but th things are getting better because people are becoming more aware now of the significance of these well procedures and, and how, Im how important okay. it is to fabricate these alloys in a certain way. Okay, right. So I think we're, we're one minute before the time. Um, I can't uh, get through to all the questions, so I'll, I'll just have to leave a few of them. Thanks everybody for uh, contributing tonight to all the questions and answers. I just want to finish up by saying a big thank you to Malcolm for uh, giving us the presentation and asking all the questions this evening. I think it was an excellent overview. It's really just touching the surface of, I think, a very important issue that we all face, um, the whole area of uh, corrosion management. So all I'll say is, you know, if you want to contact Malcolm, um, his name is Malcolm Nickel. The company is NSpec Technology, worldwideweb.nspectechnology.com. And uh, I'm sure he'll be able to help you. He has helped me on uh, a number of occasions in the past when I've had problems with fabrication and welding and corrosion. So I'm sure he'll be able to help you too if you have anything. Um